Alright guys, Unit 3, Video 12, Stabilization Policy. Go check this man out, they're called the National Song. Really, really good. Great stuff. Alright, Stabilization Policy. Enough about me. Um, <clears throat> we're talking about government policy to reduce the severity of recessions and rein in excessive expansions. Alright, so what we are really saying in so many words is that the government at times, like we know, it likes to get involved in the economy. Uh, we are already aware that the economy will, will self-correct if given enough time. Uh, the thing is, we don't know how long it takes. And as you remember, um, in the short run, prices and wages are sticky, slow to change, slow to rise um, when unemployment is low, slow to fall when unemployment is high. So at times, because we don't know how long it takes for those prices to become unsticky and become flexible, the government might want to get involved. And they will get involved whether it's a recessionary gap or an inflationary gap. Sometimes that's a little weird to people, um, but with a recession, they're obviously trying to stimulate the economy, and that's what we experienced a few years ago. If you remember George Bush and President Obama, they both uh, passed stimulus bills to increase government spending and to cut taxes so that they would try to stimulate the economy. At the same time, sometimes the expansion might be getting too far out in front. Like we might be actually producing beyond potential output, and that can't happen forever either, and so they might worry that it's going to lead to higher inflation. So in that case, they act as someone who puts the brakes on the economy. They actually slow it down, um, and we'll get into that a little bit more. So the thing about government stabilization policy is that while it is able to effectively respond to demand shocks, um, it's not very useful for responding to supply shocks. And the reason for that is pretty simple. Government spending, if you remember, that is one of our um, parts of GDP, right? C plus I plus G, government spending. So that is a determinant of aggregate demand. So the government is able to influence the aggregate demand curve. Um, so if we have a demand shock, whether positive or negative, the government can offset that and bring us back to equilibrium if they want to, or they can try to, but they can be somewhat effective doing that. When it's a supply shock, on the other hand, that doesn't really work too well because um, what we have output and prices are moving in two different directions. So in this case, output is falling while price level is going up. So what do you do? If you increase aggregate demand, well, that's going to lead to higher output, which is good, but it's going to lead to an even higher price level, which is bad. Or if you go the other way and you decrease aggregate demand, well, now the price level falls, which is good, but now output is even smaller, and that's definitely bad. So it's useful for demand shocks, not so useful for supply. Not so useful for supply shocks. All right, so now getting into the terms a little bit more specifically, we have fiscal policy. Um, it's just talking about tax and spending. It's something that the president and Congress, they're in charge of our fiscal policy, tax and spending. Um, the number one source of federal tax revenue is from the personal income tax, um, so they change our tax and spending policies. So now getting a little bit more specific, we have government spending, and this is these are government purchases of goods and services. Remember, these are things that are counted in GDP, so this is that letter G. Um, they're counted because the government receives a good or service for it. On the other hand, we have government transfers. Remember that these don't add to GDP. This is when the government gives money to individuals without receiving a good or service in return. And usually we're gonna think of government social programs. When we think of government transfers, um, these are programs intended to protect families against economic hardship. Um, so we have ones that are designed for elderly people who obviously most aren't able to work anymore. Um, to make sure that we don't have a lot of poor old people in this country. That's probably not the best thing for society. So we have things like Social Security and Medicare. Um, on the other hand, we also have ones to help uh, people who just don't have very much money, who are jobless, unemployment benefits, um, which is actually called SSI is the acronym for that, Supplemental Security Income. Um, Medicaid. Welfare is actually called TANF, T-A-N-F. It's Temporary Assistance for Needy Families as well as food stamps, which is actually SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Um, regardless of which one these are, these are all giving money to people 
um, and the government doesn't receive anything in exchange for that. That is part of fiscal policy, um, but it doesn't count for GDP. So just be aware of that difference. All right, now what's really important is the fact that the government has two different types of spending. It has mandatory and discretionary, and you can see this chart here with your 2015 fiscal year. Um, over two-thirds of federal spending is mandatory. This pie chart has it just a little bit differently. It's a 65, but it doesn't include interest on the debt at 6%. Generally speaking, that's included in the mandatory column because the government has no choice. They have to pay the interest on the federal debt. Um, so 71% in 2015. I want you to think about what that means. This is spending that's going to happen automatically without Congress or the president doing anything. So our budget was nearly $4 trillion this year. 71% of that, so you're talking about nearly $3 trillion of that, so somewhere in that neighborhood of like 2.7, 2.8 out of the, I forget, it's either like 3.8 or $3.9 trillion, is untouchable by the president and by Congress, which that has a lot of policy implications and the fact that maybe we, well, that doesn't really matter for this, our purposes. Um, what does matter is that the discretionary, that's the only thing that they really have control over on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, so discretionary, oh, well, that's the next slide. So we'll get to that. Mandatory, though, social programs, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Um, these are mandatory spending programs that once the law has been passed, the government is required by law to spend that money in the future. The only way to change that would be to pass a new law changing the old one. A lot of times that can be very, very difficult to do. So unless that happens, it will be unchanged. And the largest areas of mandatory spending are Social Security and Medicare. Okay, um, we have expansionary fiscal policy. I kind of expected there to be a discretionary spending slide. I'm curious if I just left that out. I think I might have. Um, discretionary spending, by the way, it's just stuff that the government has to approve um, every single year. So it must be approved annually. And this is things like defense and education would be our biggest aspects of discretionary spending. All right, so two types of fiscal policy. We're going to have expansionary and contractionary, and you can see they're actually both graphed for you there in the image to the right. Um, their effect of expansionary fiscal, like it sounds, we're trying to grow the economy, so it is going to increase aggregate demand, shift it to the right. Now, in that picture, it has a long-run aggregate supply curve. That isn't really necessary because you don't know. We might not have been in a recessionary gap, but um, so either way, it doesn't matter. If you increase aggregate demand, the three ways the federal government can do that, increase government spending, cut taxes, increase government transfers. Those are their expansionary policies. On the other hand, the contractionary, they're doing the opposite. They're trying to slow down an excessive expansion, so they want to reduce aggregate demand. The way they do this is the opposite. Cut government spending, raise taxes, or cut government transfers. There is a major word of caution, though, with, when it comes to fiscal policy, and that is that there can be time lags. Time lags. This is time passing from the start of the output gap, so whether it's an inflationary um, or recessionary gap, positive or negative output gap. From that start until the policy is actually implemented, there's going to be some time. Because first of all, you've got to recognize that there is a gap then Congress and the President have to pass the bills and the laws and get them signed into law. That takes a long time. And then from the time that they actually make that law, then there's another time lag that goes by from when the law is made to when it is actually implemented and affects the economy. So what this means is that stabilization policy can potentially actually destabilize the economy. Um, because maybe you're trying to stimulate, so you want expansionary fiscal policy because we're in a recession. But by the time that that uh, stimulus goes into effect, the expansionary policy, we are out of the recession already, and now you ended up creating a boom when you didn't mean to. Or the other way, maybe you're trying to rein in excessive expansion, um, but by the time everything, these lags are worked out, you actually create a recession. Um, so this is one reason that a lot of people are major opponents of active stabilization policy by the government. You know, there's a saying in Tennessee, well, saying in Texas, probably Tennessee, says, "Fool me once, shame on, shame on you. 
Fool me can't get fooled again. This has been a Lil Money production.